Hello and welcome to Daily News Simplified, the what, why and how of newspaper analysis from the perspective of civil services examination. Today we have taken up daily edition of the Hindu newspaper dated 12th of August 2023. The articles that we shall be covering today have been displayed on the screen. Let us now begin the discussion. June industrial growth slows to 3.7%. So industrial production growth slowed to a 3 month low 3.7% in June. An index of industrial production is the indicator which gives an idea about how the manufacturing sector, industrial sector is performing. And one of the main reasons why it has happened is because our manufacturing sector is not kicking and absolutely not alive. We always grudge about low levels of employment and contribution to and from the manufacturing industry or the industrial sector. And at the same time, we also know that for India to rise up in the ladder of developing countries and to become developed, there is no better way to increase this contribution coming from manufacturing sector. If we want to employ more and more people, especially in low skilled or unskilled jobs, we need to create more jobs in manufacturing sector, which is not happening right now. Apart from that, if you look into GS Paper 3 syllabus, effect of liberalization on economy followed by changes in industrial policy and their effects on industrial growth is a part of your syllabus. And when we talk about Indian manufacturing, there are three main dimensions which you should be concerned with. First is what is the current level of manufacturing in our country? What is it that the government is doing to help manufacturing sector in our country? But still, there are a lot of challenges and then followed by solutions. And all of this we are going to discuss in next 18 minutes. Let us now begin the discussion. So in order to understand the full spectrum of this manufacturing sector, you will have to go back and look as to what other countries did in order to become a manufacturing hub. Countries across the world have relied upon basically three modes to develop industrially. Geography, geology and genes. Countries such as Switzerland and Mauritius have focused on promotion of tourism, which is basically your geography. Whereas countries such as Saudi Arabia, Australia, Canada have relied on their rich natural resources and countries such as Singapore, Thailand and South Korea and also China have relied on low cost manufacturing by making optimum utilization of their human resource, which is symbolically represented as the workers who normally wear jeans. Now, in spite of having world's second largest population, India has failed to capitalize on genes and promote low cost manufacturing, which is the topic for today's discussion. Now, in this context, the Indian manufacturing sector exhibits many peculiarities. First is that its contribution is not just low, which stands at around 17%, but at the same time, it is stagnant through many decades. Second is that its composition is more skewed towards the skill and capital intensive industries or activities. And third, only a small share of employment in manufacturing is in organized manufacturing. The unorganized manufacturing sector accounted for almost 70% of total manufacturing employment. And finally, employment is heavily concentrated in very small firms. And so if India wants to increase the share of manufacturing sector in overall economic activity, if it wants to employ a lot of people by offering low skilled organized jobs, India needs to do a lot of things. And it's not like India is not doing anything. India has indeed come up with a lot of schemes, policies and various other kinds of measures which are directly or indirectly indeed helping the manufacturing sector. And so let us now quickly have a look at all these initiatives. Starting with, of course, our favorite Make in India Action Plan, which has aimed for increasing the manufacturing sector's contribution to 25% of the GDP by 2020. That has not happened, of course, because of various reasons, but that was the plan. Then we also have National Manufacturing Policy of 2011, which aimed at creating 100 million additional jobs by 2022. At the same time, we know that investment in infrastructure is extremely important for industrial growth and government has indeed taken a lot of steps in that regard. For example, National Investment and Manufacturing Zones or NIMZs, Special Economic Zones or SEZs, Industrial Corridor, Dedicated Fred Corridors and projects like Sagarmala and Bharatmala. 
all of them have together tried to strengthen India's infrastructure so that our industrial sector can be given a rapid boost. Then there are a lot of other schemes as well directly trying to help the manufacturing in our country. For example, production link incentive scheme, startup and stand up India, mudra scheme. Then we have national manufacturing competitiveness program, zero defect, zero effect, all of them trying to make it easier for companies to conduct production in our country. Then there are a lot of recent policy initiatives. For example, government has recently redefined the MSME. Then consolidation of labor laws into four labor codes. Government has also reduced the corporate tax rates. Then there has been an increase in FDI limits on various sectors such as defense. Then recent public procurement policy. All these recent initiatives have been done in order to give a boost to manufacturing sector in our country. And then most latest addition is Atmanirbhar Bharat with its catchy tagline vocal for local and protection to domestic industries through tariff. So you can easily see that government has indeed taken a multi-pronged approach to give a big push to India's manufacturing sector. But then still it's not kicking up. Of course, one of the reasons in recent times since last two years is the COVID-19 pandemic. But then there are other issues as well. And so let us now take up these challenges one by one, starting with the financial sector. As we already know, NPAs have been at very high level consistently in past decade. And so these NPAs of Indian banks and liquidity crunch faced by the NBFCs has led to reduced credit creation within Indian economy. Then another set of challenges emanate from labor laws or archaic labor laws. The archaic and antiquated labor laws have led to higher compliance burden on the firms and have disincentivized the private sector from investing in the manufacturing sector. Then Indian manufacturing sector is special in a case that it faces the problem of missing middle. The manufacturing sector is basically dominated by very large number of small enterprises and a relatively less number of large scale manufacturing enterprises. And there is almost near absence of middle sized firms, which is known as missing middle. And such a peculiar scenario is referred to as problem of missing middle. And this has been basically attributed to government incentive structure and policies because most of the government schemes and policies can be availed only until a ceiling of investment or size is hit. So for example, if you look into the categorization of MSME sector, it is based on investment. And so as soon as you grow out of that particular limit, you will stop receiving the help from the government, which these industries or the companies do not want. And so in order to keep availing these government benefits, most of the companies prefer to stay within that cap or limit. And so they never become mega firms. Then of course, we know that India, just like all other sector is lacking in skilled human resource. As per census of 2011, India has almost 53% of the population in the working age group. However, in order to optimally utilize the demographic dividend, we need skilled human resource. The lack of availability of skilled human resource is considered to be a constraint for the manufacturing sector. Then India is quite infamous for very high logistical costs. The logistical costs account for almost 12 to 14 percent of India's GDP as compared to 8 to 9 percent in other countries. And you can understand that this 5 percent gap is not something which we can ignore upon. Then in recent times, the impact of free trade agreements is something which is already being felt on India's manufacturing sector. The FTAs signed by India with developed countries such as Japan, South Korea have led to import of cheaper foreign goods and hence adversely impacted the domestic manufacturing. Then the level of corporate tax rates within India was considered to be at least 50% higher as compared to other emerging economies. It was only recently that the government has decided to reduce the corporate tax rates and bring them on par with the tax rates prevailing in other countries. And so the impact of this step is going to be felt in five years from now. But so far, this was also one of the major reasons hindering the growth of industrial and manufacturing sector in our country. And then lack of technology adoption, the adoption of new technologies like AI, data analytics, machine to machine communications, robotics and related technologies, which are collectively called industry 4.0 are a bigger challenge for SMEs than for organized large scale manufacturing sector. 
So while these are the most important and significant reasons attributing for lack of growth of industrial sector in our country, but there are other reasons as well. For example, cumbersome land acquisition procedure, poor ease of doing business, greater amount of policy uncertainty and poor infrastructure. And list just goes on and on. But these are the most important reasons. When you have to write an answer, you cannot write all the points because you have to prioritize as there is a word limit. And so when it comes to 150 or 250 word answers, these eight to nine points are more than sufficient. And so what could be the solutions or way forward that we can think of with respect to increasing the industrial production in our country and starting with coastal economic zones. And so there is a need for port-led industrialization by fast-tracking implementation of CEZ or coastal economic zones. Setting up of coastal economic zones in China, such as Shenzhen, enabled it to attract manufacturing companies from Taiwan and Hong Kong. And hence, there is a strong need to replicate the same to attract companies from China now. We have created special economic zones, but we created them and distributed them across the country without paying attention to the fact that they should be on the coastal locations. And now is the time to reform that policy. Then there is a need to focus on sunrise sectors. There is a need to focus on these emerging sectors which are based on new age technologies such as blockchain, robotics, machine learning, big data, AI. And there is a need to leverage opportunities created by Industrial 4.0, which we saw is one of the challenges which Indian industry is facing right now. Then there is a need to boost innovation through startups. Conducive ecosystem for nurturing and promoting startups through access to finance, handholding, access to market and tax incentives. If this is done properly in an institutional way, there is no doubt that the new and emerging startup ecosystem in our country is going to thrive and take industrial sector a long way. Next set of suggestion deals with foreign investment, but through plug and play model and just not investment on which count India is already doing well, but now is the time to adopt play and plug model or plug and play model under which the investors are provided with all the paraphernalia which is needed to start or initiate a business and production. So for example, the investors are provided with land at affordable cost with all necessary pre-clearances, including environmental clearances. And if we are able to provide this, that will obviate any doubts that investors from across the globe might have before investing in our country. So for example, it would provide inbuilt office spaces and all the basic facilities such as electricity and water and one of the biggest advantages of such a model is that it kick starts the production as early as possible without any hurdles. Some of the states such as Maharashtra, Haryana have decided to adopt such a model to boost foreign investment. And this model indeed needs to be replicated by other states as well. Then there is a need to facilitate investment by reforming public sector banks to enhance credit creation, strengthen corporate bond market and improve financial position of NBFCs. Because if you remember, we started the discussion of challenges by stating that there is a poor condition of the financial sector. Because our banks and especially the public sector banks are reeling with high level of NPAs and so they are not able to extend the credit. And so there is a need for reforming the governance structure of the PSBs so that they are not only able to identify the stressed assets, at the same time they are also able to recover more loans. At the same time, the private company should also have other avenues for finances, which is corporate bond market, which is quite underdeveloped in our country. Government needs to financially support manufacturing clusters and provide single window clearances to entrepreneurs and investors. And there is a need to extend production link incentive scheme to almost all the sectors related to manufacturing. At the same time, there are other solutions also or way forwards which can be written. For example, there is a need to focus on quality standards to boost exports, renegotiation of MTAs and skilling India. But these points are sufficient for the purpose of mains examination if there is a question of Indian manufacturing. You should recall the various dimensions and the dimensions are what Indian government is doing as far as manufacturing is concerned, what are the challenges which are still plaguing manufacturing in our country and what could be some of the possible solutions. Let us now move on to the next news.
If you read the newspaper on a day-to-day -day basis, you often encounter news related to tribunals. The tribunals or the quasi-judicial bodies which have been constituted for mainly two purposes. One of them is to introduce some sort of expertise in adjudication, which traditional judiciary not necessarily has, and also to expedite the process of uh, administering justice. And the problem is that despite having so many tribunals, so for example, for administrative services, we have CAT, for environmental law, we have NGT, and we have 20 other tribunals serving different fields but still the problem remains and this has again brought the issue of tribunals into the news the tribunals which were created for ensuring speedy justice and disposal of cases removal of burden from higher court and lower courts have run into troubles and they have run into troubles because of various reasons there are reasons inherent to the tribunals then there are reasons due to the interference of the executive Apart from that, if you look into GS Paper 2 syllabus, under GS Paper 2, statutory, regulatory and various quasi-judicial bodies is a part of your syllabus. And tribunals are the quasi-judicial bodies. And so when it comes to that, you just don't have to understand the constitutional provisions, which we will. But at the same time, you will also have to understand what are the challenges which these quasi-judicial bodies are facing. And so we will go through this discussion now. So tribunals, what are tribunals? So if you have to define them in simple words, you can say that tribunals are judicial or quasi-judicial institutions established by law in India. Now there is a very, very subtle but important difference between a judiciary or a judicial body and a quasi-judicial body. So a quasi-judicial body is a non-judicial body which can interpret law. And so they are generally in the form of either an arbitration panel or tribunals so in this case we are going to discuss the tribunals now the obvious question which arises is that when we have such an extensive system of judiciary we have lower courts we have high courts and supreme court why do we need a separate set of quasi-judicial bodies and there are mainly two reasons for that first is that they intend to provide a platform for faster adjudication as compared to traditional courts so we already know the kind of pendency we have in our court system, right? So the pendency of cases in courts is one of the key challenges faced by judicial system. As of June 2021, there are around 91,885 cases pending for more than 30 years in different high courts in our country. So now you can imagine that these are the number of cases which have not been disposed for more than 30 years. And we have not taken into account the cases which were filed last year or in the last 5 years, 10 years and 20 years. Then in Supreme Court, the situation is no better. There are around 67,000 cases pending in Supreme Court as of 1st of May 2021. And in this regard, the Law Commission of India noted that pendency in court leads to delays in the administration of justice, thereby impacting efficiency of the judicial system. Further, it noted that in certain technical cases, the traditional courts need expert knowledge for adjudication. For example, let's say there is a case of taxation and we know how complicated taxation is. While of course our traditional judiciary goes through all the laws, but would it not be better if the cases related to taxation were dealt with people who master or are expert at handling these cases? So reinstate the same points which we have discussed. What are tribunals? They are quasi-judicial bodies established by law, which means parliament or the legislature has to establish them. And secondly, why do we need them? We need them to expedite the judicial process in our country and we need expert advice in some or the more of the cases. And for that, we need tribunals. Now there are two questions which arise. First is that what is the legal or constitutional basis for the establishment of these tribunals? Because when we already have integrated judiciary, establishment of tribunals would definitely conflict with this system of judiciary. And so there has to be a constitutional basis for that. And that is 42nd Amendment Act, which we'll discuss. And the second question which arises is that once these tribunals are established, what is their relationship with the existing traditional system of courts, which has subordinate courts at the bottom and Supreme Court at the top? So all of us know that in 1976, Articles 323A and Article 323B were inserted in the Constitution of India through 42nd Constitutional Amendment. Now these two articles, although 
established the tribunal system in India, but both of these tribunals are meant for separate purposes. While Article 323A empowered the Parliament to constitute administrative tribunals, while Article 323B specified certain subjects, such as taxation and land reforms, for which Parliament or the state legislatures may constitute tribunals by enacting a law. Now, one thing which you should note over here is that Article 323 provides only for very small number of sets on which tribunals can be provided for. But in India, you have a lot of tribunals, more than 20 to 30 tribunals. And so how is that possible? Now that has been made possible by a 2010 Supreme Court judgment when the Supreme Court clarified that the subject matters under Article 323b are not exclusive and legislatures are empowered to create tribunals on any subject matters under their purview as specified in the 7th schedule of the Constitution of India. So basically parliament can make tribunals on all the matters under list 1 and state legislatures of course can make tribunals on all the matters of list 2 and both of them can do the same for list 3. So that is it. Now here from the perspective of prelims examination two things should be noted over here. First is that article 323 gives the power to just the parliament and not to state legislature to set up administrative tribunals. And the parliament can do that both for center as well as state. Whereas in the article 323b, the power has been delegated to both parliament and legislature as far as it lies in their legislative competence. Now most of the aspirants do not have clarity as to what is the relationship of these tribunals with high court, supreme court and subordinate court and again high courts. So first things first, there is one supreme court which lies above all the courts in our country and so high courts are directly under the supreme court and our subordinate courts are under the jurisdiction of their own or their state's high court that is clear right and so currently tribunals have been created both as subordinate to high courts so there are a lot of tribunals which are located almost at the same level of subordinate courts and then some of the tribunals have also been created as a substitute to high courts, which means they lie almost at the same level of high courts or they are parallelly situated as compared to high court. So in this case, the appeals from the decision of the tribunal, for example, security appellate tribunal lie directly with the Supreme Court. Whereas in the case of tribunals, when they act as a subordinate to high court, naturally their appeals are heard first by high court and when they are further challenged they go to the supreme court so as far as the arrangement of tribunal in our judicial system is concerned we have placed them at two locations and not just one so in this case substitute to high court and in this case subordinate to high court and this is a big big problem because when you are setting up an institution to act as substitute to high court or even to a subordinate court are you able to provide that kind of autonomy, independence to these institutions so that they can act really as a replacement of high court or even subordinate court. And this is what we are going to discuss later on. And before we move on to the challenges faced by these tribunals or tribunal system in our country, it is very, very important to trace the evolution of these tribunals in our country in a very, very succinct manner. And it is not at all important to keep these dates and these recommendations in your mind, but they are going to play a big role in making you understand the tribunal system in our country. So in 1974, Six Law Commission recommended setting up a separate high power tribunal and commission for adjudication of matters in high court. And so of course that was aimed at reducing the amount of pendency at the high courts. Then Swaran Singh Committee in 1976 noted that high courts were burdened with services cases by public servants and hence it recommended setting up of administrative tribunals. An All India Appellate Tribunal for matters from labor courts, tribunals for deciding matters related to various sectors for example revenue, land reforms and essential commodities. And it recommended that decisions of the tribunals should be subject to the scrutiny of Supreme Court. Following the recommendation of the Swaran Singh Committee in 1976, 42nd constitutional amendment was passed and so it empowered the parliament to constitute administrative tribunals and other tribunals. We have discussed that. 
Since 1980, several tribunals have been established so far. One of them is Central Administrative Tribunal for Administrative Matters, Security Appellate Tribunal to hear cases against decisions of financial sector regulators, Appellate Tribunal where decisions of Central Film Certification Board could be challenged, and Appellate Tribunal for Electricity to hear tariff issues. And there are many other tribunals. But in 2017, through Finance Act 2017, the tribunal system in our country was reorganized. It was reorganized by merging tribunals based on functional similarity. And so, the number of tribunals was reduced from 26 to 19. And at the same time, the Finance Act 2017 delegated powers to the central government to make rules to provide for the qualification, appointment, removal, conditions of service for chairperson members of tribunals. And then, in 2021, we have Tribunal Reforms, Rationalization and Conditions of Service Bill 2021 because of which we are discussing the whole thing today. As the bill was pending at the end of the session, an ordinance with similar provision was promulgated in April 2021. They abolished nine tribunals and transferred their functions to existing bodies, judicial bodies and mainly high courts. And so the main challenges which these tribunals face is right there on your face, on your screen. It is the ability of the government to tweak with their service conditions, the way they are appointed, the way they are removed, the way they are merged, the way they are created and abolished. This is not possible in case of traditional judiciary. The government cannot abolish High Court, Supreme Court or even the local level of judiciary. And so the obvious question which arises is that when you are transferring such important judicial powers to an authority like a tribunal, are you enabling them with the same kinds of autonomy, independence and powers? You are not. And so whenever we talk about the challenges being faced by the tribunal system in our country, mainly we talk about two challenges. First is their quasi-judicial bodies, whether they have the same degree of independence from the executive as the courts that they replace. And the second deals with their success in achieving quicker decisions on disputes. Of course, in addition, their place within the constitutional scheme of our country has been questioned a lot. And Supreme Court has examined some of these issues and has laid out some principles. And let us now start understanding the challenges faced by tribunals by degree of independence that they have. And it is important for these tribunals to be independent because you are transferring the powers of adjudication of high court to them. And so if they are not independent like high court, how are they going to function? So what are the parameters on which we are going to judge any institution's independence? Of course, the selection process, its composition, term of office of its members and administration of its tribunal. Now we understand that total insulation of judiciary from all forms of interference from the executive is a basic essential feature of the constitution, right? And tribunals are quasi-judicial. Now generally what happens in the selection process of these quasi-judicial bodies or tribunals is that there is a panel which selects the members. So for example, the selection committee for appointment as a member of central administrative tribunal consists of one member from judiciary, which is a sitting judge of a Supreme Court who is nominated by Chief Justice of India and three representatives of the government of India. For example, Secretary to the Government of India, Secretary to the Government of India in Ministry of Law and Justice and of course Chairman of Central Administrative Tribunal himself or herself. So now you can see that there is 1 is to 3 ratio of judiciary is to executive in the selection committee. And so you can say lack of judicial dominance in the selection committee of tribunal violates the doctrine of separation of powers. And it is actually an encroachment on judicial domain, right? And not to forget that executive is often a party in litigation themselves. Then the next important challenge which the tribunals face is about the composition of the tribunals themselves. We know that tribunals contain both members from judiciary or judicial members as well as expert members or people with technical knowledge. And that is what, this is what distinguishes a tribunal from a traditional judiciary where all of the members of a bench are just judges. And so in a lot of tribunals, the composition is such that the technical members are in majority, whereas the judicial members are in minority. And so when you are transferring a matter from a high court to a tribunal, this is where you breach or dilute the independence of the judiciary. So dominance of executive not just in the selection process, 
but also in the composition of the benches as well. Then the term of office or the conditions of office of members of these quasi-judicial bodies is very very important. Because if government has power to remove them, to reappoint them, to make them members of other committees, then of course it is going to impinge upon the independence of these tribunals. Now short term or tenure in the office is very very problematic one. Because by the time members achieve the required knowledge, expertise and efficiency, their term gets over. Further, it discourages meritorious candidates from applying for such positions as they may not leave their well-established careers to serve as a member for a very short period. And so in 2020, Supreme Court stated that the term of office for the chairperson and other members must be 5 years, subject to maximum age limit of 70 years for chairperson and 67 years for other members. We know that the administration of these tribunals are under some or the other ministries. So when the administration of a tribunal is being handled by a ministry, of course it does not bode as well with the independence of that organization. So this is about degree of independence which has four parameters in it. This is a very crucial one and this is the biggest challenge that they face. But the biggest reason for which the tribunals were set up was to expedite the cases or reduce the number of pendency in the high court and the lower court. So how has been the success of these tribunals in achieving quicker decisions? But as it turns out, a lot of tribunals are facing the same issue of backlog of massive number of cases. So for example, Central Administrative Tribunal still has around 45,000 cases pending. 90,000 cases are pending in Customs, Excise, Service Tax, Appellate Tribunal. Income Tax Tribunal has around 90,000 cases and 10,000 and more than 10,000 cases in Armed Forces Tribunal. And similar is the case with most other tribunals as well. And so if you compile all this data together, it is almost at the same level of that of traditional judiciary. And so the people start asking question, how good or what is the benefit we are deriving out of these tribunals? They are neither independent nor are they doing their work faster than the traditional court. And of course, the biggest reason behind this pendency still continuing in tribunals is the lack of human resources because they don't have adequate number of judges. If they have sufficient number of judges, they don't have staff to support them. And then finally comes the matter of constitutional scheme. Where do they actually fit in and how are they justified? Because the constitutional standing of tribunals has been questioned. In particular, whether the jurisdiction of high courts and supreme courts can be removed at all. So in 1986, Supreme Court ruled that parliament may create an alternative to high courts provided that they have same efficacy as high courts. So you can transfer them some powers, they can replace high courts, but they need to have the same level of autonomy and independence as that of high courts. But Supreme Court made an important observation. Supreme Court stated that tribunals must not adjudicate on questions related to the constitutionality of their parent statutes. So for example, if there is an income tax tribunal, they can interpret and discuss various cases, adjudicate on various matters based on IT Act, but they cannot, the tribunal cannot question the constitutional validity of the Act itself. So this is what Supreme Court has said regarding the tribunals and this is also one of the challenges because simply they do not have the same level of efficacy as that of traditional judicial system. So what about the tribunals reforms bill? What are the provisions of this bill? So the first provision is that it transfers functions of key appellate bodies from appellate bodies to either the high courts or to another existing tribunal. For example, Cinematography Act has appellate tribunal which now has been transferred to high court if this bill passes. Similarly, appellate board for Copyright Act has been transferred to commercial court or the commercial court division of high courts. And similarly, you can see that there is a lot of rationalization which has been done with respect to a lot of tribunals existing. Then as we have discussed that Finance Act 2017 did a lot of changes. It empowered the central government to notify rules on composition of search come selection committee, qualification of tribunal members, their terms and service condition. Now the bill removes these provisions from the Finance Act. Then as far as search selection committee is concerned, it will consist of Chief Justice of India or a Supreme Court judge appointed by him, two secretaries nominated by central government, sitting or ongoing chairperson or a retired Supreme Court judge 
or a chief justice of high court secretary of the ministry under which the tribunal is constituted and similar is the case with the state tribunals as well and finally as far as term of office is concerned the bill provides for four year term of office subject to the upper age of 70 for chairperson and 60 for other members so these are the provisions which are being brought by the new bill now you have to let us know in the comment section whether these provisions if implemented and passed by the parliament are going to enhance the independence of tribunals or not let us now move on to the next discussion this very important news has appeared on page number one center seeks to overhaul british era criminal laws so indian penal code criminal procedure code and evidence act are to be amended and for this reason government has tabled three different kinds of bill bharatiya nyay sangita bill 2023 which replaces the IPC Bharatiya Nagarik Suraksha Sangita which replaces the procedure code and Bharatiya Saksha bill which replaces the evidence act as far as the process that was adopted to determine the content of the bill we can already see that during the pandemic in 2020 an expert committee was constituted to undertake public consultations and make recommendations that process of consultation left a lot to be desired in terms of its composition and the modes of participation that it adopted. There were also concerns about the limited perspective from which it was approaching the issue of criminal law reforms. There was no real information on the methodology that the expert committee adopted to process and analyze the submissions that were received. The committee's recommendations to the government of India are not in the public domain. It is in fact possible that there is a divergence between the committee's recommendations and the contents of the bill that have been tabled in the parliament. It is also not known whether the government undertook other consultation mechanisms towards determining the content of these bills. So what changes within these bills significantly impact framework of Indian criminal law? So first significant change is the introduction of new offences that were absent in Indian Penal Code like acts endangering sovereignty, organised crime, terrorism offences, mob lynching, sexual intercourse by deceitful means or false promise to marry. But the manner in which the offences are drafted continue to perpetuate the problem of vague criminal law provisions that exacerbate the risk of arbitrary arrest. Also, some of these offences borrow heavily from the existing legislation on organised crime and the UAPA without clarifying the reasons for or consequences of such borrowing. That said, it should be noted that certain problematic IPC provisions do not find place in the Bharati Nyaya Sangita. These are So for example, there are no provisions similar to section 377 unnatural offence and section 309 attempt to suicide. So decriminalization of homosexuality by the Supreme Court is now being followed through by the legal measure also and now the suicide has also been decriminalized. Sedition as an offence is not present but the introduction of acts endangering the sovereignty as an offence is perhaps the most draconian provision in these bills. Not only is the provision vague, the manner in which it criminalizes certain actions is bound to give the police unchecked powers of arrest. In the Bharati Nagarik Suraksha Sangita 2023, the period during which an arrested person can be sent to police custody has been expanded. Like in CRPC, an arrested person can be sent to police custody for maximum of 15 days after the date of arrest, but in the proposed law, these 15 days of police custody can be spread over 60 or 90 day period depending upon the offence. However, the Nagarik Suraksha Bill has significant improvement for the rights of the victims. Perhaps the most important of these is the provision allowing registration of FIR in any police station irrespective of where the offence was committed. The provision requiring mandatory video recording of search and seizure seeks to address fairness in the police investigations. The Nagarik Suraksha Bill also seeks to plug an important gap by making it the responsibility of a prison superintendent to ensure that an application is made to the court to release under trials who have completed half or one third of their maximum possible sentence. 
there is also a clear push to expand the use of electronic evidence and to bring in forensics in a big way however crucial questions concerning the collection and analysis of forensic evidence along with the manner in which they are used in court remains unaddressed in the proposed procedural or evidence law have previously identified problems with the laws been addressed obviously not much attention has been paid to the problems that have long plagued indian criminal justice system overcrowded prisons and the large proportion of under trials is a burgeoning crisis reforms in bail adjudication are a crucial component of this and the new bills do very little to resolve the manner in which the bail is adjudicated and assessed these bills also do not move towards effectively realizing the commitment that the bail should be default option and incarceration the exception the prevalence of torture and the backdoor entry of torture based evidence in criminal trials is well known while confessions to police are not admissible per se empirical research sufficiently documents staged recoveries which become the sole basis of conviction in many cases in the absence of direct evidence while clause 118 of the bill on causing grievous hurt to extort confession might be read as an attempt to criminalize torture there are significant limitations with the provision as well without appropriate changes in the evidence legislation on recovery evidence based on statement to the police the institutional reality of torture will obviously continue the troubling approach to criminalization and punishment and their relation to social problems continues in these laws they perpetuate the thinking that criminal law is the first and the only response to social problems there is a crying need to start realizing that criminalization as the go to response is not effective solving social problems is a far more complex exercise and resorting to criminal law is just a populist measure so what role do legislative measures play in bringing about lasting change there has never been any disagreement about the need for reforming the criminal justice system and criminal law framework however legislative change by itself cannot be sufficient the bills in their current form do not rectify long identified problems with the law and the process but even if they had addressed those problems it is doubtful whether it would have been sufficient an area of relative disengagement and apathy remains institutional reforms the attraction that the immediacy of legislative change offers has overshadowed the less immediately observable change that accompanies institutional reform even as it is the more urgent and helpful cha- change to effect the barrier in bringing about reforms in the police force prison administration or even courts is not just one of inertia but also one of intention for instance informal and problematic incentives and disincentives that form part of the institutional culture are rules that actors in those institutions play by because that is acceptable mode of executing responsibility those playing by the rules are often worse off these informal incentives and disincentives find their way in because of ever widening gap that are often caused by low pay harsh service rules poor working conditions constant pressure and ultimately an uncared for system multiple reports have already highlighted problematic practices in the police and prisons but the solution often becomes about an individual as an errant and not about the institution the inertia that has beset the institution in the criminal justice system is perhaps because the intention to bring about those changes has been dimmed by the effort it requires and the delay in any reward it will reap so while legislative changes are important centuries old institutional culture and realities can undo even meaningful legislative changes this is not the first time that changes are being made to criminal laws the effort to truly understand the colonial legacy and undo it has remained an unsatisfactory effort through the decades the present attempt does not take the country further along that path by merely deleting certain references truly undoing the colonial legacy would mean uh, fundamentally changing the conception of the relationship between the state and the citizens